Let's turn to what we now know about schools in England. Inadequate requires improvement, good, outstanding. Parents, teachers and school staff will all be familiar with that grading system, but it is no more. Parents are going to see new grades this academic year, the Department for Education says. And Branwyn Jeffries, our education editor, joins us now. Branwyn, many people will remember um, the news of the suicide of head teacher Ruth Perry. Um, what have her family said about this about this change, the coroner having ruled that the original system contributed to her death? Her sister, Julia Waters, has told the BBC that the entire family are absolutely delighted. In particular, <coughs> excuse me, Michelle, in particular um, Ruth's two teenage daughters, because this is the one change that they had asked for. Ruth Perry took her life while she was waiting for an offset inspection report to be published, which would have graded her school inadequate. And the coroner asked one key question at the end of the inquest, which said that that inspection had contributed to her death. Asking why a school like Ruth Perry's, like Caversham Primary, which was good in almost every respect, but had some failings that could be fixed swiftly, could get the same overall grade as a school that was absolutely dreadful in every respect and failing. And that's in essence what this change is about. So the overall grade goes at the top of the report that parents will often see on a banner outside a school, outstanding or good if the school has done well. Everything else that sits below that remains unchanged for this school year. Mm. So parents will still get a grade for each aspect of the school's performance, quality of education, behaviour of pupils, the leadership and management, and the same report of three or four pages describing what that means in more detail. And that is a transition until we get a report card system next okay. year. But those four grades across those four categories, are they, are they numbers, are they A to E, or are they also using words like good or outstanding? They are exactly as they are now. If you look at a report from Ofsted, it has the overall grade, and the overall grade matters because it drives the consequences for the school and often for the head teacher. It is that overall grade that leads uh, the government to intervene, often to issue an academy order, which they now say they will be doing far more judiciously, instead sending in improvement teams, but retaining that legal right to change the management of a school if it is truly failing. The narrative below that, which starts with those categories and the words good, outstanding, requires improvement or inadequate will be the same and that's to provide some stability because this change is coming on the first day of a new school year. It, it is a radical change, one that was signalled in the Labour Party manifesto uh, but there will be some detailed thinking that is going to need to be done to deliver a report card narrative system for September 2025. Branwen, thanks very much. Let's turn to politics now. 21 minutes to seven. Talk to our chief political correspondent, Henry Zeffman. Morning, Henry. Let's, uh, let's go through what's happening as Parliament uh, returns. First on the, the Labour side, what's on the government's uh, horizon? And is uh, Sir Keir Starmer, who I note from the Times is um, celebrating his birthday today, 62. Happy birthday to the Prime Minister. Is he still getting a, a bit of stick for a somewhat gloomy uh, Rose Garden talk last week? In short, yes. Uh, I mean, the Labour government is trying to bounce back into the parliamentary term with a big burst of political energy. So there's lots of big ticket legislation heading to the House of Commons this week on big Labour promises. So the renationalisation of the railways as franchises come up for renewal. That's being debated in the Commons this week. The fiscal lock designed to give more independent oversight to uh, budgets. That's in the Commons this week. GB Energy, the creation of a publicly owned energy company. That's in the Commons this week. But hanging over all of that are questions about the budget, which will come at the end of next month. Now, Rachel Reeves has made one of what she says will be several difficult decisions already, and it's that one about the winter fuel allowance being means tested. She announced that before Parliament broke up for the summer. And over the summer, Labour MPs have received emails from anxious constituents about whether they can afford that. And that might 
calcify among some of them into more frustration. But look, let's remember, Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves say there is a £22 billion black hole that they have found. Well, the means testing of the winter fuel allowance is only going to fill a very small part of that. So there clearly are more difficult tax and spend decisions coming down the track over the next couple of months. And that's after an election in which uh, some of the big taxes, uh, you know, changes to them were ruled out. What of the uh, Tories then? Because we're finally getting some action on the uh, Tory leadership race this week, aren't we? A bit of action. I mean, we're still not going to know who's succeeding Rishi Sunak as leader of the Conservative Party until early November. But this week, six will become five in the leadership contest. And today, a couple of contenders are launching. So Kemi Badenoch, who's had a very quiet summer, but is absolutely one of the front runners, will launch her campaign today saying Labour are clueless irresponsible and dishonest. Uh, Her fellow former cabinet minister, James Cleverley, is also formally launching today. He'll say that he thinks that the the government should eventually abolish stamp duty. Other candidates, Tom Tugendhat, Priti Patel, Robert Jenrick and Mel Stride. Now, worth noting, you know, of the front runners, I mean, Robert Jenrick only has 14 MPs who've endorsed him. Kemi Badenoch only has 11. So you might think it sounds like it's taking a while for Conservative MPs to endorse, to get off the fence. And that's undoubtedly true. But it's also a reminder that the Conservatives only have 120 odd MPs. Yes. So very small numbers of MPs will sway the future direction of the Conservative Party. Henry, good to talk to you. Thank you. And it will be the Education Secretary, Bridget Phillipson, who's um, with us on the schools change at 10 past state. And we are asking for your thoughts on that change to the schools inspection regime in England. If you're affected by it, a parent or teacher, perhaps then send us a voice note on WhatsApp. Tom, thank you very much indeed. It is nine minutes past seven. So a new term is starting in England this week and a new inspection regime for schools. No more single or two word inspections such as outstanding or inadequate in secondary schools. The inspection standards will remain the same and the reports will still grade areas such as quality of education, behaviour and and leadership. The government said the change, which follows the suicide of head teacher Ruth Perry in 2023, was needed to reduce the high stakes for schools and give parents a better picture. Well, let's speak to Amanda Spielman now, who is uh, was Chief Inspector of Ofsted from 2017 to 2023. Amanda, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming in to see us. What do you make of this decision? Well, I think it means that the new government recognises that the previous government had simply loaded school inspection up with too heavy a burden of consequences. And it means that behind the scenes, government is changing or withdrawing many of the policies that it had hung on overall effectiveness judgments, especially academisation. I simply could not respond to many of the concerns last year because the government at the time wouldn't acknowledge that fear of inspection overwhelmingly related to the fear of consequences. I listened a lot to the sector. I knew that. So this is this is quite an, a very interesting switch and, and potentially a powerful switch to say all of the richness of the information that inspection provides really matters. Those judgments of individual areas really matter. Um, I think this is beneficial for inspection. I think it's beneficial for schools. I think it's beneficial for parents and children. I mean, the one word or two word system was in place for many years. So there must have been a case yeah. for it. What was that case? People mix things up. Um, It's not actually the wording of judgments that's changing. It is the overall effectiveness judgment that's being removed. Now, it's the consequences that were hung on that 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 were doing the damage. There is actually some value in an overall effectiveness judgment. Many inspectorates use them. Um, but it's but but if it is going to carry disproportionate weight, it's better to focus people on the individual judgments like quality of education, behaviour, personal development and so on. But what was that value? If there was a value, what was that value? Was it the clarity for parents? Yeah, when you you survey parents, generally they like the simplicity and clarity. Various surveys have showed stronger support from parents for models with overall effectiveness judgments. But nevertheless, they had become, because of the, the weight of consequences that government had hung on them, they had become more of a problem than a help. Because last July you said that it would become a problem if they, the assessments, became, as I think you're repeating now really, if they became so wrapped up in so many words that it's hard for parents and users to know yeah. what they need. And is that still an, a concern for you? Um, it would be, yes, but this announcement is not about changing the wording of judgments. Um, it's it's a, simply about taking out that overall effectiveness judgment and the consequences linked to it. There was a big ratchet in 2021 when the academisation Um, was linked not just to inadequate judgments, but also to a second requires improvement judgment. And that really increased 
fear in the sector to an unhelpful degree where people could barely concentrate on the process of inspection because they were so worried for their future. But isn't there then a danger that this move reduces the clarity for parents? That's that's the risk. And this shouldn't be about simply putting the interests of schools and their staff ahead of children. It's really important that inspection is first and foremost for children. Um, but I believe that you can do that um, provided you have this full set of judgments. Um, the other thing that I think is implied by this announcement is that the short, ungraded inspections that we're all government would fund Ofsted to do for most schools will be scrapped so that it can do a full set of judgments in every inspection. And to what extent do you think the government is softening the consequences of inspections? It's clear from the announcement that that ratchet of the second requires improvement um, judgment leading to intervention is being taken out. Um, I advise government strongly against putting it in in the first place. Um, it's also clear that they will rightly be keeping the power to intervene um, for schools with serious problems. And of course, that's a very necessary protection for children and their parents. Do you think it's a bit weird that they've said they'll scrap these, but they haven't been very clear about what's going to replace them? Yes, there's very little that's being taken out. It's actually only the overall effectiveness judgment that's being taken out, which means government is taking... I couldn't change that because the policies... Government had many, many policies that linked directly to those policies. So so nothing could change at the Ofsted end because government did, didn't want to change. And has that, um, but the, the scorecard that comes out, that, that, that is the next stage, I would expect it to look like an evolution of the scorecard that inspections already give about quality of education, behaviour, personal development. It'll be an iteration of that. And has Ofsted got the resources to do what it needs to do? Um, it hasn't had... Um, been properly resourced for a very long time. Three quarters of the school inspection budget has been gradually pulled out of it over the last 20 years. Do you want Bridget Phillipson, who's on this programme, less than an hour to provide more money? Well, to provide a full scorecard in every inspection will mean more inspection work. And that needs to be funded? Um, that will have to be funded, of course. Amanda Spielman, very good to talk to you. Thank you. 14 minutes past seven as many children head back to school today for that new academic year. MPs head back to Westminster for their own autumn term, which will include the first budget of the new Labour government. And today means welcome back to the airwaves to our political editor, Chris Mason. Morning, Chris. How are Hi, you? Hi, good morning. Yeah, very well, thank you. Um, so how do you think that from the government's perspective, how do they want this period, this long run up to the budget to feel? Well, they'll want to project a sense of sort of energy and getting on with stuff. We heard in the news a few minutes ago some of the legislative plans that are coming from uh, this week. But the backdrop is clear and one that they have chosen to paint themselves, which is this rather grey autumnal uh, kind of gloom uh, as far as what they say are the tough decisions, the tough choices, as Rachel Reeves, the Chancellor, put it over the weekend, that they've got to take. They've been feeling a little bit of heat uh, from uh, the charity sector, from some of their own MPs, certainly from opposition MPs, around the whole decision around uh, winter fuel payments and that being restricted to just those on uh, pension credit. And we know that there will be other difficult decisions, as ministers like to describe them, in other words, putting up taxes and cutting spending to come. And it's a long old countdown until the budget, because the budget isn't until the end of next month and we're only just into this month so that gives you some sort of sense of the time they are giving to roll the, this sort of pitch of gloom if you like. Well is it going to continue that way or is there a sense that perhaps they've gone a bit too far on that? There is a sense from some that they've gone a little uh, far and I think they will try and feather it, counter it a little bit uh, in the coming weeks with a bit of a greater sense of um, uh, of optimism. At the same time, their overall strategy is one of doing the tough stuff first. They make this argument that their inheritance means that that is necessary. You hear a counter argument, we'll hear it this morning from some of the Conservative leadership wannabes, that that is to... Uh, overstate things but there's a political logic so say plenty in governments doing the tough stuff now because you do it immediately after an election rather than and I shouldn't mention the next election now should I really but <laughs> rather than when another election is getting closer. Yeah well of course by the time the budget comes that new leader of the Conservative Party will have been in place for several weeks what's your sense of that race? Well well not quite because no. the, the whole thing is going on uh, for ages it's a four-month contest and we are 
two months in. So this contest is twice as long as it took Christopher Columbus to sail to America and two and a half times as long as Liz Truss lasted as Prime Minister, but is not atypical for a big party that's lost an election to go through a, a, a decent length um, uh, campaign for a new leader. We won't actually find out who the new Conservative leader is until the beginning of November. Budget's at the end of October. So there is, in that sense, this long, long wait for a new Conservative leader. We've had snazzy social media videos, we've had splashes of geographical masochism from the candidates dashing around the country in August, and there's more of it. There's Kemi Badenoch, uh, seen by quite a few as the front runner, uh, giving a speech later. James Cleverly too, the former Home Secretary. Robert Jenrick was out over the weekend. Tom Tugan will be out tomorrow. So there is plenty to come and that will ratchet up with the first uh, voting on all all of this happening on Wednesday and one of the uh, one of the six wannabes uh, knocked out. Chris Mason, thank you. Well, just going back to uh, Ofsted for a moment, we know many of you feel very, very, very strongly about the Ofsted inspection regime have written to us in the past and we're very keen to hear from you. So uh, just tell us what you think of the decision to scrap that single headline grade. Perhaps you're a teacher or a parent who's been affected. Perhaps you're a grandparent. Perhaps you're a former inspector or indeed a current pupil who feels strongly about the new regime or the old one, whatever it may be, please send us a message. We'll put your thoughts uh, into the mix and we'll consider them uh, as we interview the Education Secretary, Bridget Phillipson, after eight o'clock. Ruth Perry was a respected and admired head teacher of a primary school whose life was derailed when the school she loved and nurtured was found to be inadequate by inspectors. The notes she left detail how she feared that finding, which took the school from the highest standard, outstanding, to the lowest. She worried not only about how it would affect staff and the community served by the school, but the entire area. Later, a coroner ruled that the Ofsted report had contributed to her suicide. Today, that one or two word system has been scrapped by the government. It was a manifesto pledged by Labour and one welcomed by teaching unions. And Bridget Phillipson, the Education Secretary, is in our Westminster studio now. Good morning. Hello, good morning. There is a a recent survey, indeed it's being published by Ofsted, um, which shows that four in ten parents like what is now the old system, the single word judgments. Can I read you, first of all, one email that we've had this morning from a parent who's called Anne, who said, I found the simplicity of the one word ratings very helpful. It didn't overly sway my judgment as the content of the report itself was always quite clear as to how the judgment was arrived at. My fear is that this simple system will will remove will be removed and then the parameters of the rest of the report will be changed such that it becomes confusing to parents. How would you convince Anne that the new system is going to be better? So as a parent myself, I want to get a really clear sense of what schools are doing well, but also where there are areas for improvement with a sharper focus on those areas where we need to see the greatest change. So this is about shining a light on those areas about and as well about recognising what schools are doing well. I don't think we can capture the entire essence of a school in one word. I don't think that is the right approach. And there is broad consensus for this change, for the need to reform Ofsted and how we use this as a focus for driving up standards within did you our not, schools. Did you not find the old system useful, though, as a as an indicator, as a as a guide into a full report? I think parents are capable of understanding a wide range of information, not just everything being boiled down into one word. And the report card system that we intend to work with Ofsted to introduce will capture a wider range of data and information that I think parents do want to hear about. So, for example, lots of parents tell me they want to get a clearer sense about the support that's in place for children with special educational needs and disabilities. That's an area I think a new system can better capture so that parents have got a better range of information. But alongside that, we move away from a system that is both low information for parents, but also high stakes for staff too. Yeah, but that's a year away, isn't it, that new system? So what you're talking about now is one person who's on a senior team in a school in London wrote to us to say, how will the government ensure that a one word high stakes judgment is not simply replaced with a judgment of four high stakes words? 
uh, per school. Now, I'm going to explain why she's saying this. It's because those same words, inadequate, requires improvement, good and outstanding, are still going to be used, aren't they, on the four categories under which an inspection takes place. So in moving away this year from the one word, the four sub subcategories that sit beneath it will remain. And as Secretary of State, I won't hesitate to act, to take action where schools are failing. That is an important responsibility. Our children deserve a brilliant education and we need to make sure that's being delivered. But in developing the new report cards that will follow, that will take effect from September 2025, we do want to make sure that we get that right. And that's why with Ofsted, there'll be a process of wide engagement and consultation with parents, with teachers, with school leaders, in order to design a system that better reflects a school's right, strengths, but, we're talking but about also identifies we're, areas for development We're talking about this well. academic year, aren't we? So how, if it's reductive to have an overall single word judgment, then why isn't the same on each of these individual ca- categories? Because it's... That captures, for example, the quality of education. There are four different subcategories that sit beneath it. To boil it then down into one word, I don't think properly reflects what is working well and also what needs to change. So alongside the changes that we are making where it comes to these uh, one-word judgments within schools, we also intend to put in place much more support for schools that are not making the progress that we would expect to see. The, The previous government took their eye off the ball on this. I want to make sure that we drive up standards, that we make sure schools are getting the support that they need to make improvement. And I won't hesitate to take action if schools are not making that improvement because our children only get one chance when they're at school, one chance, and we have to get that right. Well, let's talk about that because as things stand, it was quite clear, wasn't it? Indeed, it was in law that schools which have received an inadequate rating from Ofsted became academies and schools which have received two or more consecutive ratings below good might also be converted into academies. So in this academic year, what is the trigger? So it will be the inadequate subcategory and I will retain the power to take action to make structural change or to put in place support for schools that are failing. Absolutely, that is important. Inadequate in any one of the four categories? Yes. Leads to becoming an academy? It can do or it could involve support being put in place. It will depend on the... Well, I retain the power to issue an order to convert that school into an academy that remains the case in law and that is an important uh, part of the system because we do need to make sure that where schools are failing action is taken to drive up standards but there are lots of saying but there are lots of discretionary than the old system no it is not we retain i retain in law the power to act to insist that a school becomes an academy But the point that I would make is that we have lots of schools within our system where progress is slow, where in some cases those schools are already academies and they are not delivering the quality of education that parents expect. That's why I will also make sure that we put in place additional support through regional improvement teams to focus on those schools that are not delivering the education that we need to see for our children. Where does the money for that come from? Uh, We will make sure that uh, through ending the tax breaks that private schools enjoy, we will invest within our state schools. And that also applies to making sure we've got the right to teachers. Well, it raises quite a lot of money. So it goes to a number of different areas. It raises, as you will have seen, the Institute for Fiscal Studies have identified £1.3 to £1.5 billion net. So you're confident then that the changes that are coming in on VAT on private schools cover everything that you want to do on teachers and on inspections? I am confident that we will have the resources that we need to make the change that parents want to see and to honour the commitments that we have made within our manifesto. Except aren't you going to need more inspectors? There is a challenge around uh, recruiting and retaining inspectors, absolutely, and that's a conversation that I have had with the Chief Inspector. But I think if we can make reform of Ofsted happen, if we can refocus its work and make it somewhere that school leaders want to go and to be a part of, then we can succeed in supporting more people into those roles within Ofsted to combine their work as school leaders with work as part of inspection. And I know from speaking to school leaders that previously, given the system that we had and the culture that we had, they didn't always feel comfortable being a part of that. So the shift that we're seeing today is about standards, but it's also part of a wider reform in terms of how we move to a better system of accountability overall. Accountability is non-negotiable. We need to be confident that children are getting a great education, but we have to be better than this. But the the better system that that you're talking about 
it is going to be much more intensive, isn't it? If it's if it's going to really give the kind of detail and accountability you're looking for, we heard from Amanda Spielman uh, um, an hour ago, who said that as it's as things stand, Ofsted hasn't been uh, properly funded. If if you're going to, I, I just want to be clear that you're confident that all of your plans, including the ones coming in in a year's time. Are you saying that all of your plans for for the responsibilities of your department are going to be fully funded through the tax changes on private schools? Uh, We will make sure both through the tax changes and as part of the budget and conversations are ongoing around that, as you'll understand, that we have the resources that we need in order to deliver a brilliant education for our children. Labour governments always prioritise education and that is what you have seen from this Labour government, a real focus on making sure that education is front and centre of national life once more. And where it comes to the shift in the system that you just described there, absolutely this will involve shining a light on areas that have not had enough attention in recent years where it comes to Ofsted inspections, the terrible rates of persistent absenteeism that we see in our schools, the need to ensure that schools are more inclusive, that they properly respond to the challenge that families are experiencing around special educational needs and disabilities, that we do not see practices like off-ruling within our schools. All of that will be considered as part of this revised system, but it is important as a part of that that we move away from those reductive one-word judgments that I just do not believe Mm. should be part of a a proper, strong accountability system. When you've talked about absenteeism, you've you've pointed the finger at parents taking their kids out of school on... on on cheap holidays. Now that you're saying as a government that you're going to act against um, uh, against dynamic pricing or high pricing on tickets. Perhaps you should do the same with travel companies and airlines. Look, I do understand the pressures that families are under, the fact that they want to take a holiday. And of course, we keep all of these areas under review. But there can be no there can be no good reason to take your children out of school during term time. It causes disruption to their education, but it also disrupts the education of all children within that class and within that school yeah, community. Because teachers end up having to underline that message repeat work, why cover, not, cover all ground. It's not, we why, always, why, why not act on travel companies and airlines the same way that you seem to be prepared to do on ticket touts and, and, uh, and ticket websites? I, I agree it's an area that requires further consideration, but at the start of the school term, what I would say is that we all of us have responsibilities. We have responsibilities as parents to make sure that our children get off on a really strong start and are in school because if we know that if children miss days in the first week, that sets a really bad pattern for the weeks to come and it leads to longer term absence. But absolutely, government has a role in this too, as do schools. We've got to work together, all of us, to book this trend that we're seeing where one in five children are regularly missing time in school. That is causing lifelong damage to their to their learning, to their outcomes, and also uh, from recent work that we've been able to publish, it causes lifelong damage to their earning potential as okay. well. I'm, this is, se- I'm, this I'm is just really serious. You're not serious. quite telling us whether you personally would like to see action that means that holidays are not cheaper outside term time. Yes, it is an area that I would like to consider, but this is not what we're seeing here, really. This is a much bigger challenge in terms of the fact that, sadly, too many parents choose not to send their children into school on too regular a basis for reasons that cannot be justified or explained. And we all of us, at the start of this new school term, have a chance to get off on a good foot. And that is the message that I've been sending to parents, but also to schools, to make sure that they are doing everything they possibly can to make their school community a welcoming environment for children and families and government's got a role to play in that as well and that's why we intend to deliver more support around mental health but also to reform the system where it comes to children with special educational needs and disabilities which we know just isn't serving the needs or interests of many of our children. Bridget Phillipson thank you very much I meant to say not holidays not cheaper in term time I think I said the opposite.